This absolutely shook my faith. To see the church that I have loved and followed for so many years seem to condone and support terrible crimes against children and against truth was heartbreaking to me. And I actually considered leaving the church for a while after I read the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report. I would say for me personally, I would use a different word than shaking my faith. I would say that it hurt it. And what I mean by that is, I think every Catholic has a certain amount of trust that they have in priests, bishops, people in authority in the church. And whenever you trust in people and that trust is broken, it leaves a wound. And in that way, that was hurt. My faith or the trust that I had uh, in them was definitely wounded. It didn't really shake my faith per se. Um, it was more of when I heard the news that there was going to be a report about scandals and actually reading some of the report, it was more of an, oh my God, I, in heaven, <laughs> we need you more than ever. I'd like to say no, that it didn't shake my faith per se, but I'm, I'm worried that's more because of stubbornness than any kind of fidelity to the church. It did make me think that there was something wrong with the institutional church, not the church herself. I don't think that remaining in the church makes us complicit to these terrible crimes and these terrible sins. And the moral reasons behind that is something we can get into on a later date. For right now, I think I would say I remain in the church because of this distinction between the church and her members and the church as the perfect bride of Christ. And I would kind of explain that with an analogy of the body. So say for instance, my hand was infected and I let the infection spread and it was not just hurting my hand, but it was hurting the rest of me. And if I let it go too long, it, you know, it could kill it. So I went to the hospital eventually and they had to amputate my hand. While the hand is very much a part of me in that if I say I touch something, I'm not saying, oh, my hand touched something, I touch something, you know, when I'm using my hand. With my hand amputated, after the fact, would that make me any less me because, oh, well, the part of this part of me would be gone. Well, no, I'd still be just as much me even without my hand because even though my hand is part of me, it doesn't define me. And that's kind of how I would say this whole thing with the church works. Like, there are people in the church who are an infection to the church and have done terrible terrible, terrible things to people and not have only just hurt one part of the church, but through the infection they've allowed have spread to other parts and hurt her in other parts. Uh, that comes in the form of hurting other members of the church, but also in hurting the church herself. And that means that the church suffers with every victim of sexual abuse, with every single one of them. So. To me, it boils down to the fact that I do love the church. I love the bride of Christ, and I love the victims of sexual abuse. And right now, by people they should have been able to trust without fear, they've been abandoned. And that breaks my heart, because on a much lesser scale, I know what that feels like in my own life. As I wrote about on my blog later, it was the words of the Mass that actually got me through this crisis of faith in the Church because I realized that we are a Church that's in need of healing. And that is part of our identity and it has been part of our identity since our beginnings. Remaining in the Catholic Church doesn't mean that we condone the sexual harassment and abuse of people by clergy. If anything, we very much so condemn these acts um, being recently married um, and being experiencing the fullness of sexuality in my marriage, 
has really opened my eyes to the beauty of what God has intended sexuality to be and to even think about or read about the horrible and disgusting things that have happened um, over the past 50, 60 or so years really, you know, makes me see how this gift has been twisted through the abusive and harassment acts um, that have been perpetuated against our faithful and the innocent. And if anything, um, it makes me cling more, even more so to the beauty of chastity, um, the beauty of confession, the, the, the sacraments, and me running closer to Jesus through these sacraments that have been given in the Catholic Church. The way that you can trust a priest again is by getting to know really faithful priests. I happen to know a lot just because of the nature of going to school here at Franciscan and just knowing people through even the internet or my home parish, stuff like that. The way that we can trust priests again is by knowing good and holy priests because people can pretend to be good people. Priests can pretend to be good people but it's really hard to pretend authentic holiness. And you can, you can kind of just tell when someone is authentically holy. I know it's very difficult to trust priests right now. And many of you are looking at your own pastors and wondering if they have skeletons in their closets that they aren't telling you about that might come out later on and break every one of your hearts. But what's helped me to trust priests is to remember the very good priests we've been given as well. By way of illustration, when I was in my teenage years, I struggled a lot with depression, with self-harm, and on several occasions, I actually attempted suicide. When I was 18, I did have a suicide attempt, and I went to my pastor about it for confession a few days later. I had been expecting my pastor, who is a very manly man, who goes hiking, goes biking, loves dogs, celebrates the Novus Ordo ad Orientum, to just say something like, suck it up, or this is a dark night of the soul, just have faith and it'll get better. But as I told my pastor that I had attempted to end my life, he started to cry. And this manly man was sobbing in the confessional with me, and he was so sorry. He said he was so sorry that I felt my life wasn't worth living and that he couldn't help me and that he couldn't make everything better, but he was going to pray for me and he was going to be there for me no matter what. And in that moment, he was my father. He wasn't just my pastor, he was like my dad. And I think there are many good priests out there like Father Juan Carlos like the good pastors who have baptized us, who have given us communion, who have heard our many tearful, broken-hearted confessions. So I think we need to trust in those priests. And while we should have caution, we should love the priesthood for the sake of the good men who are there. He doesn't intervene for the same reason. He doesn't intervene when you or me sin. Um, Sin is so offensive to God that he could will us out of existence before we even do it and it would make total sense. Like as offensive as sexual assault is to you and me, we just have no clue how much it hurts the heart of Jesus Christ. And I think about that a lot, you know, me even just saying something mean to my little brother is just so cosmically offensive to the Lord Jesus that he could will me out of existence to avoid the pain and to avoid just the the sin that that brings into the world but he doesn't because he loves me right and that's really easy to say when you're talking about something as trivial as saying something mean to your little brother but when we're talking about sexual assault it gets a little heavier i think some of us might wish that that person was willed out of existence before they sexually abused a child um, that brings us to the question doesn't god love the victims Oh my gosh, yes. Yes, so much, yes. And he also loves the abusers. And I don't know how he does that. I mean, 
I was talking to a friend of mine about this before and I was just so fired up and angry about what these people can do to other, to children. I mean, and, and she was like, can you forgive them? And I was like, well, first of all, not really. Like, I, I don't have the ability to forgive them because they didn't sin against me. But like, if someone did that to my kid, I don't know if I'd be able to forgive them. But just the mercy of God is just so annoyingly vast. From a factual standpoint, sure, you could try to answer it easily, but from an emotional standpoint, there's no easy way to answer this. And I get that. So I'm not gonna try to shove the facts down people's throats. But I am going to say that even though I can't fix a problem, even though I can't say or do anything to make anybody feel better, I can say where I think you need to keep your eyes. And it's not just on Christ. I'm not here to tell you to just pray away all your problems. It doesn't work like that, especially with this. All I'm saying is to keep your eyes on the crucifix. Because, as I mentioned earlier, God doesn't let you suffer from a distance. He's there in the midst of your suffering, particularly on the cross. That's what he did for both you and me. On the cross, he suffered more terribly than anybody has ever suffered before. And with his arms outstretched, shoulders dislocated, scourge marks everywhere on his body, and his heart pierced, he allowed those wounds to open up an avenue to his heart where he would say, look, look at this heart that loves you so much, that is broken as your heart is broken. Here in this wound in my side, I have moved aside room for you to put your heart next to mine. It may not always fix your sufferings, but in the silence of Christ on that cross, suffering, he has made room for you to put your heart. Again, it may not fix all the problems. And, you know, entrusting your heart to him may come in the form of a long process of healing, of talking to, um, a counselor, you know, being open with particular people and just letting them be there for you in the silence. It may take a wide range of things. The important thing is just to keep your eyes on the crucified Christ. I think what we can do as lay faithful, since we can't physically stop sin from ever happening again, as much as I wish we could just stand in the way of every child predator that exists, I think that something that I've seen in safe environment training, programs like Virtus and protecting God's children and stuff like that, is a kind of lax attitude in approaching the subject matter. So people not really taking it seriously or not paying attention. I think the problem is people think that what you learn in those classes is self-evident. They think that the purpose of those classes is to tell you, hey, don't, don't sexually abuse children, which everybody knows not to do. Even sexual predators know not to do it. The purpose of those classes isn't to tell you not to sexually abuse children. The purpose of those classes are to look for signs of sexual abuse in general, right, whether in a child or another person. And those signs include things like, so one thing that surprised me was giving children candy or giving special treatment. It's, if you see an adult doing that with hyper focus on a child, like that's a sign of some kind of 
not not necessarily sexual abuse, but some kind of disordered relationship, adult to child wise. Like there needs to be boundaries, right? So I think that what we can do as lay faithful is make sure that we pay attention to the signs. Say, so you see a child that's frequently crying, like go up to them, ask them what's going on and kind of, kind of hear in their voice, like maybe there is something more abuse of any kind going on. I know for me, there was an incident where I saw a person who was um, driving alone with a youth in their car, right? And as most of us know who work in ministry, that's a no-no. Like adult one-on-one -on -one alone time is a no-no for people in ministry. And I, I kind of wish that I had said something because it turned out that person had actually had issues in the past of allegations of sexual assault. Now that it, would never, it never came out that he'd actually sexual abused that child. But I, I continue to keep that in my mind, think like, well, I, I definitely should have said something. I definitely should have said something. So that's what we can do um, to, to help stop this because getting angry on Twitter isn't going to stop it. Us understanding what the signs are and watching for them diligently is going to stop this. I believe that the the Protecting God's Children trainings of Virtus, the mandated reporter training for the states um, in place by the church, um, are already helping ensure that this doesn't happen again. Um, I myself was trained in 2013 and I think two more times over the, the, the next three years. Um, and so when I first read the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report, um, I was able to pick out red flags immediately, like, this shouldn't have happened because this is in place to take care of this issue. Like, you notify these people, um, you, you know, report these signs and such. I think we need to respond to victims of sexual abuse with great compassion and sensitivity. Treat them with love, listen to them, walk with them. Treat them like human beings because they are human beings. They're not a special class of creatures simply because they've been abused by priests. We need to believe them, we need to walk with them especially, and offer them concrete ways to help them and to help the church so that the victimization of children doesn't happen again. In my job, we have people come up to us sometimes and they'll admit that they were sexually abused or they had some kind of sexual harassment issue with someone in the past. And what we're trained to do is we're trained to say, and it takes me a little bit because I'm, I'm a big fixer. I want to fix things. You know, I want to like take this person and be like, it's okay. Like here's healing, you know, but you can't, you can't do that. We're supposed to say, all right, this is out of my experience. I don't know how to deal with this. Someone who's more professional than me needs to step in. So first off, just taking that step of humility and saying like, I'm not going to be able to heal this person on my own. So if someone comes up to you and admits they've been sexually assaulted at all by anyone, friend, family member, coworker, or a priest, right? I would say the first step would be to give them as much personal space as possible. So comforting touch on the shoulder, gauge it. Make sure you're not violating their personal space because that's already happened to them. Second, make sure your priorities are straight. The victim comes first and their healing and then justice for the perpetrator. So that means that if someone comes to you and says, I've been sexually assaulted, the first thing you need to say is, are you okay? How are you doing? Not who did this to you? Let's go tell someone, okay? Third, you need to refer them to a counselor. Because like I said, healing is primary. And that counselor can work through them until they are ready to come forward and report it to the authorities. Um, sometimes I feel like, like I'm, I'm a very justice-oriented person. The first thing I want to do is like find out who did this and like just plaster them. Make sure, make sure that they are, they are put away so they can never do this to anyone again. But again, our priorities have to be straight first, the victim comes first and the perpetrator comes second. Because if you go after the perpetrator, if you focus all of your energy on the perpetrator, you're going to lose the victim in the process. I think we as a church community need to be firm with our bishops, that we expect them to stand up for virtue, especially for justice, that we will no longer accept them hiding or shuffling around 
their priests who have done bad things simply because those priests are their friends. We as a church, as a young church, have tremendous power to make our voices heard as no other generation in the church has before us. We need to use those tools to get the bad bishops out and to congratulate the good bishops who do things well. For instance, several weeks ago, Bishop Jeffrey Monfortin of the Diocese of Steubenville heard that he had a pedophile priest in his diocese. And as soon as he found out, within minutes, he had already called the police to arrest that man. He had removed that priest's faculties, and now the priest is in jail. He will never hurt another child again. We need to congratulate the bishops who do that well so that they can be models for the other bishops around them of what the church expects from its hierarchy. Bishops, please hear me when I say that wolves dressed as sheep among the congregation is one thing. But when a wolf is dressed as a shepherd and leads his sheep astray, that is quite another. The priests that have perpetuated these acts against the laity and those that they were trusted to lead as a good shepherd. And those who did not take proper action to make sure that these priests were removed from their positions and passed them around to other parishes where they continued to prey upon the sheep. That is something that you, as a whole, are also morally accountable for. This is actually one of the things that frustrated me the most with this whole thing. I think the bishops realize how big of a deal this is. It would boggle my mind if a human being saw widespread sexual assault and didn't think that was a big deal. Now, what I think is happening is we have, we're dealing with politics here, right? We're dealing with uh, polished statements and everybody making sure they choose their words very carefully. And I think that's what, that's not what we're doing here, right? Like, th this is, this is New Catholic Generation's way of saying, like, enough with the polished statements. Let's just be real for a second and talk about how we feel. Um, I think some of the bishops have forgotten that they're supposed to be our fathers. I think that's the, one of the biggest problems here. Like sexual assault aside, like we've been dealing with that for a while now. We need to take steps in that direction, but where this, this rot has come from is from the root of the fact that the bishops are forgetting they're supposed to be our dads, right? And when a dad messes up, he doesn't walk up to his son and say, the father's office has concluded that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, during a homily, he's not like reading straight off a piece of paper. A father, a good father who messes up and it directly affects his son, goes up to his son and says, son, your dad is a sinner. I messed up. Here's what I'm going to do to fix it. That's what I want the bishops to do. Like that's, I feel like that's what we all want to do. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys saw that video of Cardinal Whirl giving a homily and someone stood up and said, like, just, just talk to us. Um, I don't necessarily like the idea of standing up in the middle of mass and yelling at a bishop, but I mean, that's how frustrated some people have gotten, right? And it makes sense. They're supposed to be our dads. So I guess in summary, I wouldn't say the bishops don't care about the issue. I think they've just forgotten what that sacrament of holy orders did to their souls. I don't understand how this isn't just obvious for anybody with authority or even without authority to take this seriously. It should be a no-brainer. But as I've seen over the past several months, for a lot of people, they don't take it seriously. Even clergy in the church, whether that be priests or bishops. So what I would say is this. To any clergy members who don't take this seriously, I say none of this out of gossip or hatred or desire to see your downfall. All I simply say is that if you do not take this seriously, you are abusing both the hearts of the victims of this terrible crime and sin 
but also the very heart of the church, which you have been given the responsibility to protect and defend. The victims of sexual abuse need your help. Those of us who watch them suffer need your help. And the church needs your help. Please don't abandon any of us.